All right, our final speaker is none other than Ennie Hickman. And Ennie has been a ministry leader for over two decades. He has been very involved with the University, the Franciscan University of Steubenville conferences. He has been involved in the Fullness of Truth conferences. They're based out of Houston. He's appeared on the Matt Frad podcast. Uh, he's known for his raw and honest communication, his passion and love for Jesus Christ. And he and his wife, Cana, have eight children ranging from 21 years old to two years old. So I'm sure it's a busy Hickman household. <laughs> And he, about three years ago, along with his wife, founded Del Rey Collective, and he may tell us a little bit more about that. I promised you I'd tell you what his name means, because I said, where, where, where's Annie come from? And I wrote down what he told me, but I can't read my writing. I think it's from a French name, Eamon, Eamon, something. <laughs> he can explain it. Please give a very warm welcome to Annie Hickman. I've really enjoyed being with y'all today. Um... It's just uh, unbelievable to see so many men seeking Jesus, seeking a deeper relationship with him, seeking fullness and fulfillment. Um, but conferences are weird. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I've, I've, I've done plenty. And it's no, no offense to conferences or those who put them on, but they're weird sometimes. Because here's what I feel like. I feel like, well, we're in Dallas, so I feel like Tony Romo, you know, calls everybody together into the huddle. Come on, into the huddle, everybody. We get down, and he's saying, all right, you guys are blocking down. He'll say numbers or whatever, but it's like, you guys block this way. We're going this way. We're running the ball. And then ready, what do we do? Ready? Well, you can say it break, right? Okay, just do it with me. Just humor me a little bit. Ready? Break. And then they run out. Now, this is kind of how I feel on conferences sometimes. I feel like we get in here, and then we're like, football, ready, break. And then just imagine if all the players, all 11 guys went to the sideline and went, man, that was an awesome huddle. <laughs> Did you guys hear what he said? Do you guys hear what he said? Man, that was so unbelievable. Oh, he's calling us back to the huddle. And we run back to the huddle, and we get in the huddle, and he's like, all right, you guys are going to run this route. You're going to block this way. Ready? Break. And then they run back to the sideline, and they're like, man, that huddle was better than the last huddle. I loved that huddle. Remember what they said there? Yeah. Oh, he's calling us back. You get the picture, right? Conferences can be weird. Events can be weird if we don't run the play. Raise your hand if you've been to 10 plus conferences. How about 20 plus conferences? Now, maybe not this one, but just in general. Like you go to conferences, like you just every year, you're just, you know, shooting up Jesus. Ah, I got to get my fix. This is how we do it. And if you're like me and you're an addict and you just, you know, you, 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 you just shoot back and forth, you're on a Jesus high and you're like, woo, Jesus, and then you're like, whoa, high, high, and then you're like up here and then you're just trying to find a balance and, and you hope that the conference gives you that, that shot so that maybe this year will be different, brothers, brothers. It's not about the conference, it's not about a talk, it's not about the speakers, it's not about us. It's about Jesus, and this year, we've got to run the play. We've got to run the play, it's silly, because I think a lot of us, we just want to know more. We're, we're all about knowing more, we're obsessed with knowledge and knowing more, and you know, orthodoxy is great, but orthopraxy is what this world is missing. The praxis, the practice of the faith. I joke about it all the time because people are like, why aren't you going and getting your other masters? And I'm like, look, I'm just trying to live the theology I know. If I, if I learned more theology, I'd have to live that. So I'm just trying to live the theology I know. Like, for instance, right now, 
The Spirit of God is here. We know and believe that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, that his spirit dwells with us. What does that mean for our life? Or did you just yawn? Oh yeah, the spirit. Like right now, I'm not alone up here. The spirit of God is present in this place. So look, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what you're thinking about. You got to go do this evening. But right now, brothers, let's invite the Spirit to take root, to stir up what we received in our baptism and received in our confirmation, to stir it up so that this year is not just about talks or knowledge or orthodoxy, but it's about orthopraxy, that we will actually go forth from here with zeal for the world and zeal for the Lord to be his hands and feet. So will you pray with me? Would you do this weird thing and open your hands? Okay, it's not that weird. We were doing this way long before we put our hands together. This is the way we prayed as an early church, the Oran's position. It's a spirit, it's a reception. It's an idea of like, I will receive right now. So go ahead and close your eyes if you want. We're gonna pray. At the beginning of this talk, we're gonna pray. that It's not just about a talk. It's not just about the words or what we believe, but we believe in the power that is present to us in the spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Lord, we ask that in this time as we open up the scriptures, as we open up your word, as we listen and receive, Holy Spirit, that you might dwell in this place, that you might be thick, that as we go forth from here, that we might be the disciples that Jesus has called us to be. Brothers, I can't pray for you, so I invite you in your way, whatever, in your heart of hearts, if you're open to hear the truth this afternoon, that you welcome him, that you welcome him in. We pray this prayer from our hearts, in Jesus' name, through the hands of his mother. So we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Like Dave said, I, uh, well, thank you, Dave Moore and Lauren Moore. I think you guys are taking off now. I love you so much. Thank you for praying with us. Um, like Dave said, my name is Eni. Uh, it's, uh, it's an old, old, old French name, abbreviated. Uh, it, it's Emon. I'm, uh, my family, my ancestry is from Louisiana. Any, any Cajans here? Any Cajuns? No? Okay. Maybe Oklahoma? Anybody? No? Okay. 
Um, you're like, yeah, that's, that's more our style. Uh, I, uh, I've been in ministry, you know, more than I haven't been in ministry in my life. Um, I uh, married to my, my uh, college sweetheart. Um, we have eight children. Um, people always ask us whether we're Catholic or Mormon. And I just, I always say, I'm a rabbit. <laughs> Um, we, we, uh, we, we've had the privilege, uh, the blessing, the honor of traveling the world, doing all sorts of talks and uh, workshops and conferences and all sorts of things. And, you know, one of the common things that happens after, you know, when you're a speaker, you know, when you're, when you're giving talks is that people will, will affirm you. And I'm not mad at anybody, and I'm sure that somebody's going to do this, you know, when, when I leave here. And it's, it's just this, this, these two words, you know, people will say, like, hey, good talk. And I'm like, thank you. And I'm not mad, you know, if you've done that before, and, and I, sure, keep doing it, that's fine. But, but, it, but it's always kind of strange to me because, you know, like I'm not, I don't do this uh, because um, I, I want to do this. And I know that, that like might sound weird to you, um, but like, I, I, and because I, I love you, and I, I, I think you're great, uh, but I love my wife more, and I love my children more. And it breaks my heart. You know, Dave said it earlier, you know, like somebody, you know, they, you know they're asking for you. They're calling for you. I, I got to admit, during Terry's talk, I was, I was at, back, back and forth outside because my son was playing a, 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 a baseball game, you know, and I was just kind of catching up. I felt terrible. He was pitching. I wasn't able to be there. You know, the, the, the idea of, of coming and, and, and sharing the gospel with you is not because this is what I want to do. This is actually, you know, maybe one of the last places I want to be. I'm actually like an introverted person. I love to just hide away. I'm here because Jesus, well, they called me, but also Jesus called me. Right? So, so good talk is always sort of this weird thing because I'm like, well, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe it was, maybe it was good, but, but you, can you imagine, you know, like, like, man, what did you hear? Like, did you hear anything? Did you, did you get anything out of it? You know, maybe say like, something like, hey, this really touched me in here because I got to know, like, did this happen at the Sermon on the Mount? You know, Jesus like preaching the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7, I mean, he's hammering them with all sorts of things. Like, you know, this is this and this, you know, love your enemy and everything. And then someone, he's, he's like walking down off the, with his disciples and like, hey, Jesus, good talk, man. Maybe you can come do a parish mission, you know, come do a parish mission at my church, or can we get a selfie, you know, can you take our picture, right? Like, it's not about a talk. It's not about a talk. It's not, these are just words. I could be totally faking it up here. You could know the language of the faith and not go to heaven. You could memorize the Bible, you know, in 13 languages and still not make it. This is what the Lord says, right? But speaking of Matthew, uh, you know, 7, right? Open up your Bible if you've got it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Because I say, Lord, Lord, a lot. We're praying, I'm singing, we're in, Lord, Lord. You know, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who proclaims Jesus with their mouth will enter the kingdom of heaven. It says, it goes on, he goes on, he says, but he who does the will of does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not just saying these things. Verse 22, 722 of Matthew it says, On that day, the day, right? He's speaking of what day is he talking about? The day, the day he comes back. Oh no, it could be now. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That, that's speakers. That's Catholic speakers. On that day, he'll come back, and if, I can, if, if all I have to say is that I gave talks, 
Like, Lord, Lord, man, I gave, I gave the talk at the uh, Catholic Men's North Texas thing, remember? I, I was all over the place. I was, I was prophesying in your name. We cast out demons in your name. Like, I've never done that, but that sounds pretty important, right? Casting out demons in your name, and we did many mighty works in your name. You know, Jesus, I was a part of the building committee. I mean, look at this church we did. I, I'm, I'm, I was, I'm a Knights of Columbus, man. I was frying fish. Like, I'm doing all sorts of things in your name. And he and I will say to them, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. This is a tough passage of Scripture. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that it's about doing the will of his Father, not just saying the things. Not just doing, you know, mighty works and prophesying in his name, but knowing him and him knowing us. He says, as a friend, as a bride, as a son, as a daughter. This is the truth. And if you have ears to hear, like in Luke 4, right, when he cries out, or 8, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? Jesus preaches way different than any Catholic speaker, by the way, right? Jesus, this is, a, this is an example of Jesus' preaching. In Luke chapter 4, right, a sower went out to sow some seeds. It says, People came to listen to Jesus from town after town, and he came to them, and he said, what did he say? A sower went out to sow some seeds. Some fell on bad soil, blah, 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 and some fell on good soil and produced fruit. If you hear me, hear me. Good night. Right? That's what he says, right? So that's, that's, that's it. That's the whole thing. If you, you can go look, look that up. He did not explain it. He didn't explain it to the crowd at all. It was only after the talk <laughs> that the disciples came to him and they were like, bah, what did that mean? Like, Jesus, tell me the truth about this. And so I have to ask you at the beginning here, like, like, do you want to know the truth? Because oftentimes, right, it's like that, that movie, A Few Good Men, right? I want the truth. What is it? Yeah. You can't handle the truth. We can't handle the truth. I don't want to know the truth, really. Like if right now I could say to you, you can know the whole truth. Like everything, you know, from the start to the end, the whole truth about your life and what God wants for you and the way that your kids are going to turn out, all that. You want to know the truth? Because yeah. I want to live in my own little world. I want to live in my own little truth. I don't want things to make me uncomfortable or maybe I'll even have to change a behavior if I know the whole truth. Like summer sausage. I don't know, it's just good. Hey, any, you wanna know what's in it? Nope. I'm good. I just wanna enjoy it, right? If I knew what was in it, all kinds of ears and ligaments or whatever they make it with, I probably wouldn't eat it, but I just wanna enjoy it. We do this with God's truth. We do this with Jesus. We do this with passages of scripture. We tend toward those truths that are comfortable for us. And we sort of avoid the ones that are hard to swallow. But if we want to know the truth, we've got to seek the truth. We've got to go after the truth. We've got to listen. We've got to say, is there something I don't know? Is there more to this? Because Jesus is never in, he, he's never done with us. We're, we're always in formation. We're lifelong learners as Christians. There's no level up, level up, level up, and then you're there and you're like, boy, this is great. Because at the end of it, 
right? We're going to be called to task. Did you know him? Oftentimes when you ask people, hey, how's your relationship with Jesus? They start listing the things they do. I go to this conference. I go to this conference. I do this thing and I do this thing. No, 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 no. I didn't ask about what you do. I said, how's your relationship with Jesus? If I asked you, how's your relationship with your wife? And you were like, I go to work. I bring home the money. I fix the refrigerator. You know, like what? No, that's not relationship. That's just doing stuff. How's your relationship with Jesus going? Because that's ultimately what it's going to be about. So do you want to know the truth? Because we also hear in Scripture that we can know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm glad you all knew that one and the few good men's quote. <laughs> like, that would have been really bad if you knew one and not the other. So let's acknowledge this. Let's acknowledge the elephant in the room. The world is broken. And it's getting more and more brokener. I think that's not a word, but that's okay. It's tough. It's this generation. It's the world. It's secularism. It's, is Terry still here? California. It's, you know, it's war. It's war in your own homes. I know that for some of you, there's real tension between you and your kids. I know it. There's suffering. The world is a place, it seems, just to be sort of sliding away on its way to hell, and, and we're just watching it. And, and, and if you're like me, and you probably are, you know, it's just like, ah, what do I do? We, 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 we wring our hands when we see something on the news. I saw this sign the other day. It was really funny. It said, it said the key to happiness, don't watch the news. It was like, that's, no, that's not it. We wring our hands and we worry. We worry about where it's all going. But it's moments like this that I think there's a couple things we need to remind ourselves of, right? First, God is not wringing his hands anxiously. God is not worried. Let's sink in. God is not up on his throne going like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to my planet? God started the whole thing. He was there before there was anything. He spoke it into existence. The entire universe came out of God's mouth. Stars. Giant burning balls of gas that heat my skin from light years away excuse me, light days away, came out of his mouth. And if there's anything that I know, right, that he started the whole thing, he's accomplishing what he wants to accomplish with or without you. Please don't take offense to that. God has got this, and he doesn't need you, like Father Edwin said this morning. He doesn't. If he needed you, that would make you an ass, because that's what he says, right? The master has need of it, right? Don't be an ass. He doesn't need you. He wants you. He desires you. He wants you more than he wants to use you. Listen to that. He wants you more than he wants to use you. But sometimes we think it all depends on us. Oh, we better get out there. We belittle him when we do that. God is accomplishing what he wants to accomplish with or without us because there's no way that a star breather doesn't get what he wants. There's no way. There's no formula where God will not finish this thing the way he wants to finish this thing. He says he's coming back. And we don't know the hour. 
now. For now. For now. He's coming back. He's going to finish it. He's going to separate us between sheep and goats. He's going to call all the nations to himself. He's going to sit on a throne. He's like, hey, you guys, well done. My good and faithful servants, I knew you. You did the will of my father. And you guys, what were you thinking? Oftentimes we like to put ourselves in that first group and point our fingers at all the people out there. There's a story in scripture about the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee standing there, you know, looking at the tax collector as he comes in. He's beating his breast. That man receives salvation. But the one, the Pharisee, that's looking and judging and saying, what is this guy doing in here? <sighs> that's me. I'm looking around and thinking, man, these folks are so evil. Salvation doesn't come to me that way. Right? We find ourselves thinking we're holy only because the bar of holiness is so low. <laughs> right? I don't know. I, I travel a lot. China, I was enormous. I was so tall. Everyone said, you're so tall. And I'm like, dude, I'm 5'7". Guatemala, it was the same thing. It's just because they're so small. They're like, you're so tall. I'm like, I'm not. I'm not tall, actually. You're just really short, right? <laughs> it's the same thing with holiness. The bar's so freaking low in this country that we walk into church and we're like, boy, am I holy. What is holiness? Holiness is doing the will of the Father. Holiness is <laughs> abiding in God the Father, hoping in his salvation and trusting him in the meantime. Trusting him. Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, calls the fishermen, calls the tax collector. Do you know what he, he tells them to do, his command, his first command? Follow me. Follow me. Not worship me, not go do this, go tell the people. He says, follow me. And then at the end of his ministry, as he's ascending into heaven, we're, we're going to celebrate this, this, state, this idea. He says, go now and make more followers. Make more of you. So follow me three years. Make more followers. In the meantime, he shows us what that means. You remember the game, follow the leader? It's pretty easy, right? The leader marches, you march. You follow them, you march. The leader flaps his arms, you flap, you do a spin, right? You follow the leader, that's what it means to follow. You actually follow them, you watch them. There was, there was a, a time, it, you know, when he was asking, as he was a rabbi, he was asking followers to come and follow him. That was a huge honor. It was a saying that Jewish women, right, that Hebrew women would say if their sons ever got invited to follow a rabbi, they said, they would say, may the dust of your rabbi cover your face. Like, may you be following so closely to the rabbi that his dust covers your face. It's interesting because in at Good Friday, right, when they, or Holy Thursday, when they come to get him, there's a portion in there, and you'll remember it, because I know you've heard it. It says that Peter, for fear, followed at a distance. Close enough to follow, but not close enough to get hurt. It's kind of like me. I want to be just close enough but not uncomfortable. So you can imagine a follow the leader game where the leader is flapping his arms or doing a spin and somebody is just, the other person is just maybe just sitting on the couch. Like, hey, what are you doing? I thought you were playing follow the leader. 
And this person says something like, I am following the leader in my heart. You ever heard anybody say something like, oh no, I love everybody. Don't get me wrong, I love everybody. In my heart, what does that mean? What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means to behave like Jesus. Somebody alluded to it earlier today. We are little Christ. That's what Christians mean. That's what it means. We're little Christs, right? This is the command. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. If Jesus was on the street today in Dallas and he said something like, hey, where's the church? Jesus would not be asking for directions to a building. The church is the people. The church is the followers. You and I are the church. You and I are baptized into this family. You and I are baptized. We are confirmed. We received Jesus earlier this morning to be him in the world, to behave like him, to be seen as someone that gives their life, that loves. Turn with me to John chapter 13. Now this is Holy Thursday and sort of the This is John's version of kind of Jesus' last and final testament. Like, here it is. Here's all the things I need to tell you. And we'll get it. I mean, if 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 you're not into scripture, and that's okay. Like, if, you know, we're all here to learn, and we're all here to uh, get, you know, get better at these sorts of things. But, like, next year, if if you're coming to a Catholic conference, like, bring your Bible. Let's not make this a joke anymore that Catholics don't know the scripture. Um, But if you want to start somewhere, John, well, just all of John's gospel. I love it. But 13 through 17, it's just an incredible passage of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And, And in 13, verse 34, that really is mariachis. There's really mariachis out there. Can they come in here? I love that. (laughs) Verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So the apostles sitting in that room, right, he's washed their feet. He's telling them about the Holy Spirit. And he's like, look, a new commandment I give you. Whoa. You're a good Hebrew young man. You know what that means, right? A new commandment. Oh, my goodness. Okay. There was 10. Now there's this one. Okay. I'm listening. It's a new commandment that I give to you. He says that you might love one another. Like I have loved you. It's a pretty big deal. Love one another as I have loved you. It's a simple command. Okay, I got to figure this out, right? You command me to do this. This is important. I have eight kids, so... A house can get pretty rowdy. A house can get pretty messy, pretty, real fast, you know? Oh my gosh, what were you guys, I was gone for 10 minutes and it's just destroyed. Teenagers' rooms, anybody relate? I mean, what ha- your, your closet vomited, I don't know. It just, oh, there it is. It's the whole closet, whole contents, it's all out on the floor, right? So occasionally, you know, I have to like step up. My, my poor son, lived right, I mean, his room was right next to my, our room, you know, and so every day I'd walk by and just be like, what? No, dude, no. Clean your room. Now, if my son, 
After hearing the command, right, because it's the same thing, I command you to clean your room. If my son were to come back to me in 30 minutes later and go to me and say, hey, Dad, I memorized what you said. You said, clean your room. Heck, man, no, no, I, I, I said, no, I said, clean your room. Don't just memorize what I said. That's weird. Okay, so clean your room. Okie dokie. He comes back like 30 minutes later, and he's like, Dad, hey, I can say clean your room in Greek. I can not only say it in English, but I can say it in Greek now. Would that be okay? No. Now I'm getting angry, right? Now if he comes back 30 minutes later and he's like, hey dad, listen, I got this idea. So, me and my friends, we're gonna get together weekly, weekly. We're gonna get together weekly and we're gonna take a really hard look at what the world might look like if I cleaned my room. It would not be sufficient. But why is that okay with Jesus? Why is it okay for us to simply memorize what he said and go about our lives? Why is it okay for us to sit in a Bible study and learn the etymology of a word in Scripture if we're not going to live that command? And what sense does it make for us to get together weekly, or some of you a couple of times a week, to talk about what Jesus said without living it? The command is simple and true. Love one another just like I do. How does Jesus love us? Well, in John 15, he says, I have loved you as the Father has loved me. Okay, so I know that's, that might be, that's one level more. It might be a little complex for you, but bear with me. The Father, right, the star breather, the creator, the Logos, the Alpha Omega, right? He loves the Son. Whoa. That's a lot of love. I mean, a lot. The first person of the Trinity loving the second person of the Trinity is an intense amount of love. John 15, he says, I have loved you as the Father has loved me. John 13, he says, Love one another as I have loved you. It's a big love. Jesus loves us indiscriminately. There's no one that's written off. There's no one that's outside of the love of God. No one. There are people who choose to live outside of that love. That's their choice. But every single one of you is loved equally and indiscriminately. That's why it doesn't make any sense in the world for a Christian or a Catholic to not be for reform in making sure that justice rolls down to every race and creed and generation. Because we know that we're loved indiscriminately. God loves you. Not for what you do. He loves us as we are, not as we should be. Because no one's as we should be, right? Not a single one of us in this place. Unless you're like levitating a little bit off your pew. You know, like, oh, I am. No, no, no. None of us are, right? He loves us indiscriminately. We should be looking for ways, as Jesus commands us, to love one another as he loves everyone. Loving means willing the good, the ultimate good for another. Jesus wants our good. And we should want everyone else's good. 
We should be rooting on people instead of pointing fingers. God's not done with your children. He's not. Some of you have given up. You're like, dude, no, you don't know my kids. I promise. They're done. They're, they're way off. They, they're never coming back to the church. No, he's not done. We love them and we root for them. The homeless, that's becoming an issue, right? In Houston, in California, you're, lo- you're, you're, you're like, wow. But I hear people who are mad at the homeless. Ah, the homeless. What? Come on. We should be rooting them on. If Jesus is calling us to love one another as the Father has loved him and that he's loved us, we should be about love always. Now, I know there's issues. We can talk about those things. But your faith, your faith, not your political leanings, your faith comes first. Oh, but any, if I give out money to this guy, he's just going to go buy a beer. Okay, so he tricked you. I'd rather show up to heaven and have God say, hey, that guy you gave money to, he went and bought a beer, he tricked you. Then God say, sorry bud, I was hungry and you did not feed me. So I'm willing to take a risk there. I'm willing to take a risk there, man. If if there's a person in need, I live for that moment. The moment I'm talking about when he comes back could be now or now or now. I'm judged on my love. It's his command. I can't wiggle out of it. I can't just memorize it. I can't just say it in Greek. I can't just get together weekdays, Wednesday nights, you know, and, and talk about it. I have to actually do the thing. And he loves us sacrificially. Like where it hurts. Bad. Sometimes we give, you know, we give money and we're like, we set aside a budget for our philanthropy. But have you ever given to where you're not sure if you're going to have enough you? You ever given from your first fruits, from the bulk of the thing, where you're like, you know what, no, I, I'm going to trust because love is sacrificial. Love means going outside of myself. This is the command of Jesus to love, to go into the world and to love one another. And, and brothers, like, I mean, I say all this, and it Let me be clear, I know it's hard to hear. I know that for some of you, you're like, I hate this guy. This is horrible. (laughs) You're laughing because it's true, right? This is the truth of God. We're not known as Christians because we, you know, we we shout at people. We put them in boxes and we point at them and we go, that's the problem. No. Jesus himself says, you will know, they will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. They'll know. It says in John 17, you know, that you might be one so that the world will know. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's actually quite impossible. And here's the good news, brothers. We just prayed, like, the reality is the good news, the best news of all for the church is that the impossible is made possible with the Holy Spirit. See, the advocate is for us. He actually says in John 16 that it's better that he goes away, right? Because he was talking to the disciples, he's like, hey, I got to go. And they were like, no, why? No, please don't stay with us. Please don't go. And he's like, no, I got to go because if I don't go, the Spirit won't come to you. 
And so I have to go. It's better. It's for your benefit is what he says in 16. He says, it's for your benefit that I go away. Brothers, can you imagine how easy it would be to be a Christian if Jesus were here? Like, think about that for a second. Like, you're just walking along. You have a lustful thought. He's like, I heard that. And you're like, oh, man, Jesus, God. You're right. Imagine how easy it would be to introduce people to Jesus. You'd be like, hey, guys, uh, this is Jesus. <laughs> He's real powerful. Watch. Go, dude. But he says, no, it's better that I go. Because if I go, then I can send you the advocate. I will put my spirit in you. See, guys, it's not Jesus and me. I'm out here like, oh, man, devil, evil. I can't do it. Okay, Jesus, you go. Tag. No, it's not Jesus and me. He's not my partner. It's Jesus in me. It's the spirit in me. He enlivens the church. He inspires the church. He propels the church. He impels us. And if you're living a life of the Spirit, you're in alignment. You're abiding in the eternal one. You will live his will. So this is the best news of all. You might say, man, this is impossible. How could I just, how, how can I just be pouring out love all the time? How can I do this? It's by the Spirit. It's by the, by the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated his resurrection. That same Spirit that conquered sin and death for all time, raised him from the dead, as it says in Romans, that dwells inside us and brings life to our mortal bodies. It's the spirit that propels us outward to others, accomplishing what God is going to accomplish. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we pray. God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, not mine. We can't think highly of our, we have to like have this hum humility about us to say that God, you're in me and you're doing this great work. You're going to accomplish it with or without me. I get to come along for the ride. Check this out. <laughs> A couple years ago, well, it's probably, uh, okay, nine years ago. It's a long time. My son, you know, dads, it's like, if I was like, hey, let's go hang out and talk, right? Like, with, with your son, I'm like, mm -mm. no thanks. Right? But if you say something like, hey, will you come help me? Right? That works sometimes, right? And they can be totally terrible thing, but like we were, we were hanging a fan, which is the worst of all dad chores, man. Raise your hand if hanging a fan is like your worst nightmare. I can't stand that. Some of you are like, that's easy. No, sorry, man. It's terrible. Working with like wires up here for 30 minutes is just not my idea of fun. So we're putting together this fan my son Dominic, and I gave him the task of putting the fan blades on the, you know, uh, whatever those connector things are, right? And so he's like here putting it, and he's just totally screwing it up, like totally just messing up the entire thing, either on backwards, all this stuff. And for me, the whole idea is this time with him. I just want to spend time with him. I'm not really after him accomplishing something for me, He's not my little slave, although people do say like, oh, you have eight kids, like, you probably do nothing now, you know? I'm like, well, I haven't touched the dishes in like 10 years, but whatever. I want to spend time with my son, because I love my son, and I don't get to spend a lot of time with him, and so I want to spend time with him, and so he's doing this thing. I'm like, hey, this thing, and then he'll put them together, and then I was going over and just like fixing them. Not letting him know, like, oh my gosh, this is, what is, how did he even, what, is that a nail? You know, like, I'm just trying to figure out how he's doing this, and he just thinks he's the best thing, and I'm like, bro, you are such a great helper. You're such a great helper. Thanks, Dad, you know, you're my helper. You're my fan-hanging helper. 
you're the, you're the fan man. You're the fan man, right? And he's just like, man, I'm the fan man. I'm like, you're the fan man. You go, fan man. And he's doing this, I'm totally screwing up. Oh my gosh, what is this? You know? After we got the fan up, I had this thought. I had this crazy thought. I was thinking about this. Like, at the time, I was, you know, traveling the world. I'm on big stages. People are asking me this, that, whatever. 20, you know, 20,000 people in D.C. or here and that. And I'm doing all the thing. And I had this image of God, you know, coming. I was like, Any, you're such a big helper. Look at you, man. Giving talks. You're the helper. And I'm totally screwing it up, right? He's doing all the work. It's the Holy Spirit in me. It's not talks. God's going to do a work in you as well. And he's going to invite you into that mission. If you're living a life in the Spirit, it goes hand in hand. Communio and misio can never be separated. They are hand in hand. They're together. If you're in union with God, you're going to go and do the will of God. If you're doing the will of God, you're going to be in communion with God. We can't just come in here and be in communion. We have to be sent onto mission. And that's where he comes in. That's where he's going. And our yes right? Here I am, Lord. Come to do your will. I want to be a part of what you're up to. Rather than saying, you know, hey, God, we've got this ministry. We need you to bless it. God, just bless our ministry. That is the funniest prayer I've ever heard in my life, right? What if we said, God, you're up to something good today. You're doing a thing. You're accomplishing your will. You are doing your mission. Can I be a part of it? What if we prayed like that every morning? God, I know there's something coming today. I know you're, you're working in the hearts of my coworkers, or you're working in the heart of my child. You're working in the heart of my neighbors. And could I play some role in that? That's a different prayer. We think we're so cool with our ministries. God's like, you're such a big helper. He's doing, he's doing the work. And we get to take part in that. I know if you're here, you want to see the world transformed. I know that. But oftentimes we don't know where to start. Oftentimes we look and we see, you know, great authors. There's, there's always going to be a need for great authors. There's always going to be a need for great media. There's always going to be a need, you know, I guess now for YouTubers, you know. There's always going to be a need um, for preachers and for those who are called to, to lead. There's always going to be a need for those things, but you and I, at the base level, have been given the command to love our neighbor. But it seems silly and too simple My son was four years old, and we were coming home from church, and um, it was when we were living in Arizona, and uh, <laughs> I heard my wife talking to him. He's like, she's like, well, you're going to have to ask dad. I don't know if we can do that. So I was kind of paying attention, kind of not paying attention, driving home. Why don't, why don't we talk about it over breakfast, buddy? Okay, so we're at breakfast, and my wife says, okay, Dom, why don't you say well, you told me in the car. And he said, okay, he's like, Dad, I think it would be a good idea if we could meet our neighbors. And I said, why? <laughs> like, you know, literally, I was like, what? Uh, we, we're, gonna sell, we're gonna sell some candy? What are we gonna do, right? Like, what, what's going on? And he's like, no, my Sunday school teacher told me that Jesus said we should love our neighbors, and so I thought we should meet them. <laughs> I mean, I, like, again, here I am, like, on stages across the world. I'm, like, 
God's good helper, and I'm doing all this stuff, and then all of a sudden, I mean, this, this child speaks these words to me. Jesus said to love our neighbors. I thought we should meet them, and I'm like, I get down, and I'm just like, preach, buddy. Like, tell me what in the world you're talking about. Could Jesus have meant, hold on, my neighbors are my neighbors? So my neighbors are my neighbor, my neighbor, neighbor? We could love our neighbor, neighbors? Your actual neighbors? Like, wait, hold on a second. Like, keep, keep going. So literally, this was so transformative in our life that we moved. <laughs> like, I was like, I got to go find some neighbors to love. Like, I don't know. These, we were living in a neighborhood where people would pull it. They're in the suburbs. You know, you pull into the driveway, shut the garage door before you get out so you don't have to see your neighbors, Right? We moved back to Houston. We were in Arizona. We moved back to Houston, um, moved right back into my neighborhood that I grew up in, and um, began, well, this is 13 years ago now, we have a weekly dinner. That's it. Uh, we knew how to do that. Political signs in their front yard. We don't, dis- we don't agree on religion. We don't agree on politics. We don't agree even on like what time we mow our lawn but we agree that the tacos are good. We agree that the meal together is good. We love our neighbors. Love God, love your neighbor. When Jesus was asked to boil it all down, to bring it all down, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus? He said, love God with everything that you have, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself, your neighbor. Like, well, who's my neighbor? Well, everybody's my neighbor, right? That's what you said. I mean, well, who's your neighbor? Well, all people are our neighbor. But listen, if you metaphorically love your neighbor, the world will metaphorically change. But here's the genius of Jesus. To say love your neighbor, it's actually, it's it's brilliant. Like he was multi-level marketing way before anybody started doing that, right? Loving your neighbor like what, what if, brothers, dream with me for a second. If each one of you went back to your hood and just loved your neighbors, that could actually work. See, we think evangelism and the mission of God is so big and broad that we gotta be a YouTuber or we gotta be this or we gotta do that, but the majority of us, we just live in neighborhoods and Jesus says, love your neighbor. My neighbors, Lauren and Barrett just had their first kid, fallen away Catholics. Diana, she's drunk by 3 p.m. every day. Daisy and Roberto, great people from Columbia. Stella and Carl have 11 cats, 11. I'm sorry if that offends you because you have 12 or whatever, but that's a little much. It's more than Father Edwin, (laughs) who only has two, only has two. They're great. Um, right? Um, who am I missing? Oh, and then uh, Susan, who is, uh, well, she yelled at me for like literally the first three weeks, like every day that I moved into that house. Um, but I love a-holes. I mean, you have to. You have to. People are going to be mean. People are going to be gross. You're not going to agree with them. And again, that's the genius of Jesus. He did not say, convert your neighbors. He did not say, bring your neighbors to church. He said, love your neighbor. Why? Well, for one, it's his love that we're giving. Two, loving people that stink and are gross and don't agree with you, who are mean and ugly, makes you more like Jesus, who was spat upon and persecuted for loving. We become more and more like him when we love those who are not like us. 
He says, you'll be my witnesses, Acts 1.8, right? The Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes in power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Meaning like right here, your neighbors, and then to the ends of the earth. If I'm driving past my neighbors to go do a ministry over there, maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe let's do this. Maybe we look for our 10-foot radius. We look for right here, right around us. Your primary neighbor is your spouse. It's her. She's your neighbor. She's your closest neighbor. And if you've been married long enough, right, you know each other's ugliness. Love your spouse. How tragic it is that I see all over in ministry, this happens, and I, I'm, not, you know, I'm not saying anything you don't know, but you see it all the time. People get wrapped up in the out there. Their marriage is falling apart. Man, look at the ministry I'm doing. Pa, 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 pa. Great, but what happened to your marriage? Secondary neighbors, if you have them, is your children. Look, it's been pointed out a couple of times today, right? The bar is so low. All you got to do is say, get up. We're going to church. I love you. I love you this much. It's showing up. It's getting down on the floor and playing cars when you don't want to play. It's making that phone call. It's doing stuff they love to do. Maybe not the stuff that you love to do together, but the stuff they really love to do. It's your children. Expand out from there, and then you're looking at your neighbor neighbors. It's proximity. And then if you have anything left over, and this is how we live our life, if I have anything left over, and somebody calls and says, will you come give a talk? Yeah, then go. But if we're not doing it at home, right there in our neighborhood. We're not listening to that idea of neighbor love. Mother Teresa gave the uh, commencement address at Franciscan University of Steubenville in 1976. And of course, Mother Teresa was just, I mean, blowing, blowing everybody's socks off, like, oh my gosh, Mother, what you're doing is so amazing. And there was a line of people. They were all coming up to her and saying, I want to do it. I want to go with you. I want to go to Calcutta. I, I'm in. How do I get there? And so many people were asking this that she finally, she took the microphone back, and she could do whatever she wants because she was Mother Teresa. Father Michael Scanlon was like, okay, Mother, here, take it. And, he go, and she gets up there, and she says this, and it's recorded, and, and I'm going to read it here at the end. She says, stay, when you're talking about mission, she says, stay where you are. Find your own Calcutta. Find the sick, the suffering, and the lonely right where you are, in your homes and in your families, in your workplace, and in your schools. You can find Calcutta all over the world if you have eyes to see everywhere, wherever you go, you find people who are unwanted, unloved, uncared for, rejected by society, completely forgotten, completely left alone. Brothers, if we are going to walk out of here with anything, if we say, hey, that was some good talks, let me grab a rosary on my way out in the gift store, like, what is this for? We're given the spirit today. We're given the sacraments today, the sacrament of reconciliation. Some of y'all are white as snow. You're saints. You're walking saints right now. You've been fed by his body and blood to go forth and to be Jesus to the world, to witness his love to the world. And it starts right there in your home. Stay where you are. Find your own Calcutta. Brothers, um, the world is in desperate need of men, men who not only say with their lips 
that they love Jesus but are true followers, orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, we love you. We love you. That's why we're here. We're here for you. We're here because you have captivated us, that you've, you've transformed our hearts, that you've always given us what we need. You've helped us in our life. And so we're here because we love you. We love you for what you've done and what you have yet to do. We believe in the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you stir up that same spirit of our baptism and our confirmation, that you stir it up inside of us that it might become real and tangible in our lives and the way that we love others. God, we ask and we beg you to give us that spirit so that we can truly persevere in running the race. God, give us every blessing and gift and virtue that we need. All the graces, God. We beg you so that we be can become the disciples that you want us to be, the church, your body in the world.